You are listening to The Big Scuba. This is an audio only episode. Hey, I'm Steve Davis. I'm the host of Speaking Sidemount Podcast, and I'm here today with Ian and Gemma of The Big Scuba Podcast. Great to be with them and awesome to be on their show. Thanks for having me. Right, welcome back, everybody. Welcome back to the Big Scuba Podcast. This is episode 32, Gemma. Yep, 32. I actually had a quick look in Wikipedia to see what comes <laughs> up when you put in 32. And did you know? What are your facts? The, the fact of 32 is, is the natural number following 31. There we go. Oh, well, I never. <laughs> so that was worth searching for, wasn't it? Anyway. Uh, hello and uh, welcome back to the podcast. Now, um, it seems like ages since we uh, gathered round the old Zoom to have a chat and talk about what we've been up to. Um, I think it's because time's filled lots in between the time that we've spoken. Oh, it it? And uh, for we don't often, I, th I think we sometimes forget about the YouTube need that we need subscribers. So let's get that out straight away if you haven't uh managed to get onto youtube and look us up on the big scuba yeah you? <laughs> just search the big scuba and we'll come yeah, up with it and uh please subscribe we need subscribers all the time like, like everybody else and uh, it helps keep things ticking over and uh lets people know that you know hey we've got some people actually yeah. yeah and more importantly if you subscribe and hit the notification button you'll then know what we're up to because you'll get a notification every time we put something on youtube so you'll keep up to date with our adventures well exactly and that is very true so uh Gemma, what have we been up with? it seems like blur these last few weeks so, <laughs> so abs, we did that didn't we that, that yeah, was we... about three weeks ago and that yep. was really good Yes, yeah, so that was a little trip away, and then we had a trip to Stony Cove for the day and did three dives there, so that was a first visit. Your first visit, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, to an inland water site that I've not been to. So there's footage of that on the YouTube channel, so look that up. Yeah. And yeah, that was a really good day, really enjoyed it. So. A little bimbo about on the shelf, you know, staying around the top of the 10, 12 metres, the first time we went with Dave, but then yeah, the yeah. shelf. Yep, the visibility was okay and saw all the sights of Stony Cove, saw yeah, the Loch Ness Monster, happy one. Nessie is in there, so uh, all, everyone thinks that's all up in Scotland. No, it actually found uh, Stony Cove. So uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's a great um, yeah, dive, the great dive shop. Uh, tank refills were really easy, so yeah. really well organised. Yeah, so it's it is, very yeah and it's quite quiet there in the week. It's actually a really nice. It's nice going in the week because there's less people, and you can, if you want to go up like what we did, and you know, uh, mm -hmm. you can practice on your buoyancy, perhaps putting an SP up, uh, yeah. and just the basic skills and actually just enjoy a bit of diving. You know, yeah. That? yeah. Um, and it was really enjoyable. Yeah. In fact, without uh, too many hassles, it's nice and easy. So, so hopefully, we'll get back there um, before it starts getting really chilly. And, uh, yeah. Um, and the booking procedure, you know, to book your tickets, you know, we're all under the whole COVID thing these days, aren't we? You know, and uh, it's a really easy process to register and then book the tickets if you want to go for a dive. So. Yeah. yeah, no, it's really yeah, lovely chilled out place. Lots of swimmers are there as well. So it just wasn't all divers. All looking at us in our dry suits and thermals. Thing, and they and they're all in their budgie smugglers and swimmers. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, yeah, I've, I've got me up um i still think i was i, I like my dry suit um, I, I love my dry suit <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah i don't think i'll be swapping them from a from a speedos just yet especially as, as the water's starting to chill <laughs> uh, definitely so and um you know it is really good because it also gives a chance to uh we you know uh, we've got a power lens camera that we're, we're using and getting used to yeah. Give us, uh, try that some of the settings that's really good uh, that's a really easy thing if you're looking if anyone's listening and uh, they're looking around for a camera to use it's easy to basically to stick on the side of your mask and you don't know it's there it does everything you know it sorts the white balance out uh, it 
recoils automatically from as soon as you drop underneath, as soon as it hits 0.3 meters, it switches on to record. Um, it's a great little app to go with it as well, and it connects up. Brilliant. So it's a really good little camera to, uh, to use. <clears throat> and we'll also be using it on our kayaking as well. And yeah, yeah. So we proved that out. Yeah, brilliant. You know, connect it up. 4k uh recording as well and we went out done a couple of miles yesterday didn't we yeah and on the run it, loop yeah and had it on top of the kayak and yeah we popped it under the water as well so it worked yeah. so that little bit of footage will be coming out shortly uh so keep an eye out for on the uh, land of the youtube um and it just it's good to show that because you know money's tight isn't it? The best for most of us and uh you know and if you are looking around for a camera it's good to to, to know that if you're going to buy a camera you can use it for all sorts of things it's not just an underwater uh camera you can actually use it above the ground as well yeah, it's very it's versatile as it even tells you the temperature so how much more do you want yeah. you know depth. temperature depth sorts your white balance out comes on automatically log when you would compress you know yeah. um so no sales almost sounds like uh we're you're selling it i know so uh, should be on commission. Hmm. I have to talk to Paralens about it. Anyway, so uh, it was really good time at Stony. So look out for that. And you're getting the master of sending up an SMB. Yes. So you had a good practice oh, at that. Cool. So that's, that's really good. Um, and then last weekend, we uh, went diving again, didn't we? Yeah, that was in um, view of World River Day. So we got invited by the Green Party to Norwich. To help yeah. with a litter pick and we hey, were, Peter, give him a little shout out I said you would didn't we? Yep. So, so we were their honorary scuba divers for yeah. litter picking in the river yeah so uh, this came about I mean, um, this was early in the year when we started this whole discussion about must be about May June time when we've been talking to the Broads Authority at River Clean <coughs> uh, and they connected us up and it was really good that we could do that with Council being involved as well all the authorities involved and it's good to know that there's a whole process so we pull the rubbish out yeah people on the bank litter picking as well um and then uh with broads authority help and also city council from norwich you know all that rubbish gets picked up cleared away you know gets handled properly yeah and it was all bagged up ready for collection when we left we? yeah it was and um you know, really good turnout. Um, there's been about a good sort of 30 people there all, all helping out and doing what they can. Yeah. Uh, the people in canoes as well, Pup and Paddle had um, donated some of their canoes so people yeah. can cruise around. Yeah. Three times a year, I believe, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Autumn, spring and summer. Yeah. So uh, uh, it's really good. You know, Norwich is our local city um, on the east part of the, of the country and it's good to get involved in on an event like that it was almost although it's worldwide but it actually doing something about your local environment on your doorstep yeah that's so, right uh, so to peter thank you very much for inviting us that was really great and uh, we, we look forward to the next one can't wait so yeah. uh, good. Um, yeah. that was good a little bit of footage will be out um so that'll be out on youtube shortly yeah good. we got a little shout out on our local news channel as well yeah fancy that mum we're on telly we've been on telly <laughs> so yeah so that that was really good weren't expecting it. nice touch um and also need to say thank you to lee at scuba news uh who's done a lovely review of us um a couple of weeks ago that was really great um great big spread of all the bits and pieces that we've got to getting this uh podcast off the um from the starting block so, yeah, so it's really great to have some support out there yes also hello to jane at scoop verse too so uh, that's really good yep. who's uh has also given us a review as well so you know i think that comes up in the next week yeah so, she'll let us know so keep your eyes peeled for scoop verse yeah that's really good uh and then also the usual thank yous to the uh usual friends and supporters of the podcast so fourth element blue o2 Mares just had water. O three. Who else? Paralens. Paralens. Yeah, I mentioned them. Yeah. And our lovely Patreon. Yeah. Who, uh, no, brilliant. So thank you. And also, um, if you haven't seen it yet, um, there's also a video out from our last podcast, episode thirty-one, where we talked to Mike. Think. Think. 
Yep, a real life astronaut from NASA. Yeah, and brilliant guest. Uh, Learned loads, and I was, you know, talking to Honey about, you know, they've been watching the video uh, bit by bit. You know, right. it's about an hour long, isn't it? So yeah. they can't just sit all the children for an hour down to watch it. But they've, they've been watching it bit by bit. And uh, they're going, like, honey, you're on YouTube. And things <laughs> like that. So that's, that's really good. So um, it's good that they're all buying into it and watch it. Well, yeah. Hopefully, uh, you know, that would be spark some interest in science. Yeah. No, that was a really interesting, yes. Yeah, sort of yeah. Different view on scuba diving. Yeah, someone that's been in space. Well, one of the things, you know, he said, didn't he, right, quite early on, is that he believes that scuba diving helped him get through the uh, assessment process. Yeah, and, and the a whole load Because a, a whole load of these um, American Air Force pilots all go for assessing to see whether they can actually become an astronaut. He mm-hmm. said, you know, that he could prove that he can um, be adaptable and... Uh, survive in an extreme environment. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, the f- fears and apprehensions you might have scuba diving, they kind of prepared him for what he had to do with on his spacewalks and be calm and that. No, uh, that's what is weird, you know, because you kind of think, well, when you do that giant stride into maybe off a boat, into a, a waterway that you have never dived in, the first <laughs> thing would be a bit, ner- a bit of a nervous thing and um, for a lot of people. And I can just imagine taking that first step out of the space station. Yeah, uh, he's tethered, but he's just—I know you're tethered, but you're kind of you, you're still stepping out, aren't you? You're still stepping out of the the safety there, and you're like, whoo, <laughs> two hundred and fifty miles up from Earth. Yeah, that's it. You know, doing seventeen and a half thousand miles an hour. Exactly. So. Mind it's absolutely amazing that you we've got that technology and, and i'll tell you another thing was the suit that that suit that, that keeps them alive can be minus 200 one moment and then be heated up as soon as that comes around they're doing uh, hundreds of degrees yeah we're doing a circle of the earth every 90 minutes so by the time it comes around again they're in the sunlight that's being heated up for minus 200 up to plus 400 um, well, just imagine you know just getting a piece of <coughs> or something to be able to handle that on a, on a regular basis yeah so, great yeah brilliant um so you know look forward to uh getting mike back really uh next year after he's been on the um starline yeah it would be nice to have him back that would yeah so um one for uh someone to keep an eye out and also just need to say a very quick hello and chat out to Christina, because Christina, uh, she submitted some questions. Christina's been a long-term friend and support of the podcast. So, um, you know, it's always good to have her on on a regular basis. Yeah, and there were some great questions as well, so that he answered really well. Yeah, yeah. Between Christina and Honey, we they really put them on, under pressure. Okay, um, what else has been happening? Project Aware. This week has been, or last week has been, Project Aware. Have you been a torchbearer for a ocean protector? Yeah. You know, uh, we've all got to be responsible for this and take, make an effort and also do your bit. Uh, you know, whether it's a beach clean, whether it's picking up rubbish that you see on the seabed or riverbed or whatever. Um, so, you know, we've all got to do our bit. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, and it's it's not just one week, it is a permanent thing. So and I think we'll be talking to about it a bit more in coming episodes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. You know, it's really good. So always happy to share anything like that because I think it all, it all helps. Um and then I think that's kind of about it, I think, for the yeah, news, isn't it? We need to get straight into episode thirty two. So yeah, we've got what coming up on this episode. Well, oh, it's a guy called Steve Davis. Yeah. Also known as Sidemount Steve. He is, and he's got his own podcast. <laughs> he has Speaking Sidemount. Yeah. So it's all everything you want to know and more about the world of diving in with a sidemount. Yeah. So, which um, at some stage I do want to actually learn myself because there's quite a few people have told me how good it is. I've, um, I've dived with twin sets, you know, normal set up, easy lead system. But it'd be good to learn 
and that's experience the side now. Yeah, oh, it's worth a try. Yep, it is. Yeah, so that'd be good to do. Uh, but Steve, that's really good talk. Um, lovely guy to speak to, and uh, really relaxing. You know. You can ask him anything you want about, you know, his career and the side mounts, you know, ex-engineer for the New Zealand Navy. Yeah. Um, and do you know what? They even sunk his boat. <laughs> it's on the, on the, on the uh, what's it, Canterbury, wasn't it? Canterbury, yeah. And um, he was chief engineer. Plucked that name out of the old model. And uh, he was the engineer on that. And uh, after, it's, after it's sort of time, they sunk it and made it a reef. But he has written a book all about it. On um, how to dive it. Yeah. So uh, look out for the book. Diver's Guide to the Canterbury. Yeah, yeah. So we'll put all the links up that you need to find. Uh, we'll put links on for Project Where, how to um, get that. And also uh, how you can find out a bit more about Steve. It's always good to share those. Yeah, so I think that's, yeah, pretty much covered everything. Yeah, There's okay. lots there. There is a lot there. And also, uh, we better just say hello to Alex Bracey Music as well, who submitted some music for our last episode. So, yeah. hello to you, Alex, and happy birthday. It's his birthday this week. So, <laughs> there we go. If you haven't heard of Alex Bracey Music, look him up. He is on the U world of the YouTube. Look him up. Alex Bracey Music. Good tune. He right. has, yeah. Okay. So, that is it from us for now. Uh, thanks for listening in. Upcoming up is Steve on episode 32. Enjoy everyone. We'll speak to you again. Fall away and I'll play the fool. Hello. Good morning or good evening. <laughs> good evening. Hi, good morning for you. What's the time over there at the moment? 7 a.m. and would you believe it's still dark? Yeah, well, yeah. thanks for doing this. It's, uh, yeah, it's yeah, you're welcome. Time zones and everything. You, you make it work, right? Yeah. Such is life in a global world, hey? Yeah, it is. Exactly. Live by the power of Zoom. <laughs> so how's the, how's the podcast going for you guys? Good. Yeah. Keep yeah, us busy. Well. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's, a, yeah. there's a, lot of, a lot more work in it than most people think, huh? Yeah. It's oh, not just recording. Yeah, so but it's it's really enjoyable and yeah, it's obviously you know great talking to so many different types of people. It's you know divers, but it's a it's not a one way street at all. It's just the so sure, many different sure. avenues to go down. Yeah, and you learn so much. I found for me, I've just spent by being able to talk to some of the world's greatest divers every single time you pick up something that is just the little gem and sometimes there's one or two and sometimes it's just full of them. But every time it's something different, you know, and so it it's uh, the most enjoyable part. And of course you form relationships with them because of the, the beauty of using video, especially as well. Yeah. So even though you may not have met in person, you kind of feel like you know them and, and uh, you know, and in time, hopefully if this damn pandemic ever goes away, <laughs> we, uh, we may get to meet in person. Hey? Yeah. 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 <laughs> And that is so true because, like, uh, you know, one, you know, we've learned loads, as Jeremy said. But but we, when we talk to people, but there's certain people who come out with certain gems, and you're like, wow, mm -hmm. I, I want to use that and uh, try and learn and be better. Um, you know, Christina Zanato, we we refer to her a lot. Um, we've learned loads from Christina. You know, th the three major words for us. Um, explore, educate, and conservation, you know, and Tech Clark taught us transform, and he taught us about mm -hmm. that. And mm -hmm. you know, and it's you think, wow, you know, this is brilliant, this is really good, deep, deep stuff, you know, it's yeah. more than just um, deeper than just like you know, a piece of kit, but you know, it's, it's good, it's stuff to evolve, and you know, mm -hmm. um. Somebody taught me uh, saying that Gandhi famously said, and it's be the change that you want to be. Mm -hmm. And I've never heard of that before. And that was another one. Yeah, that's yeah, all good. Yeah. Anyway, we digress. Yeah. You know, yes, we uh, do. We kind of started before we introduced this <laughs> So, Steve Go ahead. Davis, welcome to the Big Scuba podcast. You are uh, known all around the globe, you've dived all around the globe, and you've got your own podcast. Um, Speak and Side Mount podcast, um, as well established, I think 2018, wasn't it? Was it when it started? Correct, yeah, August 2018. I sort of was bumbling through my first episode. 
yeah ex uh new zealand royal navy engineer um mm -hmm. been on uh, the canterbury and saw that sunk on purpose to form a new wreck uh, uh reef and um, we'll talk we'll talk about your book as well as uh, and also um side map fundamentals as well so we'll talk all, all mm -hmm. those sort of bits and pieces we'll try and get it all done in 40 minutes then might we might have to quickly just dial back and recover everything towards the end okay. we've got some set questions we like to fire at you uh we like to okay. fire all our guests um yes. to just get some you know get some depth <laughs> and what have you as well um, Love it. and also we'll just introduce ourselves as well so we'll just talk mm -hmm. we'll introduce us very quickly and then we'll just crack on with you and let's talk about you and put you in the spotlight for change how's that how's that <laughs> yeah turning the tables again awesome thank you very much i appreciate that introduction awesome okay so my name's ian okay and if, for anyone who's listening who haven't heard us and they're going straight in with this episode i've uh, been a die been diving for about five six years um I volunteer with my local dive club in Norwich as a dive master. I uh, really love that role. Um, I've, I've never said never be an instructor. I'm just happy being a dive master, to be honest, and I, mm. I like that role. Um, life is busy enough as it is, and I, I think until I could really give quality time to, to go down that road, I, I, I'm happy where I am. So, And it's great, mm. and I'm trying to... Um, uh, encourage my kids to get into diving or snorkeling or, or having fun on the water as well so uh, and they're a little bit younger at the moment they're um, my son is 13 and my daughter's 10 so you know uh, that's all to come hopefully for them yes. but anyway that's enough of me waffling on Gemma <laughs> Yeah, so I'm Gemma and in terms of diving, I literally qualified a couple of weeks ago as an open water Yay. dive buddy. Congratulations. <laughs> so, yeah, so obviously getting to know Ian and just kind of thought, well, give it a go. So I did start in January, but then COVID hit. So everything got kind of mm -hmm. stopped. So that was the first opportunity. So yeah, it's the second week of July qualified and then i've done a shore dive since and then we've been to another quarry so i've got eight eight dives so done so far. <laughs> well done Emma. that's so, awesome yeah yeah so i thoroughly enjoyed you know the learning process and and the qualification in dives as well it's a whole new world yeah hopefully you know i'll be able to bring my experience to the podcast as well as being very yep. new it. but yeah and outside of that you know i live on the coast so water's a big part paddle boarding kayak i am yeah, and body combat yeah, and body combat. Yeah, I oh, do. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, we're both big fans of body combat. Yeah, yeah, yeah really? bit of a gym bunny. <laughs> Actually, yeah. one of the uh, main girls from that comes from your way, Steve. What's her name? Rachel. Ra isn't Rachel it, Newsom, isn't it? And Steve yeah, Adam well, but, um, yeah, Les Mills um, is a New Zealand company. So all of this whole group fitness thing started here. Um, it didn't really start here. It started in the states. But Philip Mills went yeah. to the states way back and brought it to new zealand and he kind of started this amazing array of group fitness classes you know body combat body pump body attack i think there's a there was a body jam and a bunch it's of others i mean this has nothing to do with diving but it's immensely successful and kind of covered the world uh not that popular in the states because there's just so much else there but very big outside of the states and new zealand yeah. australia uk and europe so yeah and asia too yeah so yeah. Great, and it's awesome. I mean, I used to teach uh, pump and combat, so a lifetime ago. I'm way yeah. too old for that now, but it it's was a lot of fun, and I, I still love the concept of it. Yeah, yeah, and it's great for fitness, and you know, fitness comes into diving, so it is. It does. Hand -hand it does. Well. Mm -hmm. And we are lucky, to be fair, aren't we, Gemma? Because we've got, you know, um, it, the gym where we go to got some brilliant instructors. Um, mm. You know, they're all they're all great in their own right. You know, and uh, we're very important and crossfit as well we do that as well so uh, uh yeah it's brilliant yeah mm -hmm. so so tell us about you you know tell us about you know fill in the gaps that i might have missed out yeah well i've been diving for a long long time and, and partly because i was like one of your children i was introduced to the water very very young so i was kind of thrown in back in the 60s and 70s when um parents were still awesome but they really didn't watch their kids like like everybody does these days and we used to get thrown under the water and left there and so before i could really swim i got a plastic set of what we then called flippers or and a mask and snorkel just this kind of round um rubber with glass and um and was snorkeling around just at the beach 
And at the same time, Jacques Cousteau was on, and I was just so enamored with Jacques Cousteau and Albert Falco and Bernard Delamont, uh, Bernard Delamont and what they were doing. It just looked phenomenal to me. So mm. I kind of set my sights on. I, I really wanted to learn to dive, but never had an opportunity. And I eventually acquired a stepfather who was a Navy diver, and he would never teach me, and it, it frustrated the crap out of me. I was 13, 14, and he, he told me, he said, look, when you can carry a scuba tank on your cylinder, on your back, um, 500 meters down a beach, then I'll teach you. And I was, I've always been a small guy. So I kind of struggled with that when I was really, uh, really young, the tank, the scuba tank and, and the uh, back plate would have been heavier than me almost. But by the time I was 14, I, um, could do this. So I said to him one year when we're on holiday, I think I can do this. And so I, I trudged down the beach for 500 meters with a scuba cylinder <laughs> on my back. Not many people know this story. And, and then he said, all right, here you go. And so we, we basically walked into the water with it on and, uh, fell down just in you know one meter deep and and I went under and I'd been snorkeling for so long it was kind of what that experience of can I really do this can I breathe underwater and okay. and so you learn of course to trust the equipment and it was just mesmerizing to me and absolutely loved it I didn't get a lot of chance to dive with him but we did just the odd little shallow dive with him hanging on to me and it was in the day way back before computers um, they didn't believe in BCDs back then either and in, in terms of the Navy dive team so they it was basically you swam really hard was the way that you managed your buoyancy wow. and so it was it was an interesting time and I did my open water course in 1981 with a very famous diver here in New Zealand guy Kid. And he was a former commercial and Navy diver. And uh, it was, again, just such a great experience. Went out to the poor nights, 30 meter plus visibility, fish life everywhere. Wow. And I thought, wow, if it's going to be like this, I, uh, this is for me. Of course, uh, I then subsequently did some dives that weren't quite as pleasant, but uh, mm -hmm. that was it for me. And New Zealand divers tend to be hunters. So it's the big thing here. Almost, I won't say everybody dives, but there's a massive Basically. number of divers. Yeah, spearfish and, and, and lo crayfish or lobster, you know, and so crayfish, we call them here, and also scallops. Mm. So, you know, whenever you go for a dive, people will always ask you, what did you catch? So, it, and for a long, long time, 25 years, I was an open water diver with maybe a lot, a lot of dives, you know, maybe a thousand dives, and uh, didn't really have anything more than open water certification. And I lost my cert card, which, which was an old NZUA card before Patty came along. Um, Patty took over all of their um, all of their certifications, and so I'd lost my card. I got a letter from uh, from the dive centre to say I was qualified when I was travelling around. But I thought, oh look, I just might as well get a new card. So I did an advanced course in Rarotonga, and then I thought, oh, there's actually a bit more to this diving than just hunting. And so a little bit like Yui, and I progressed on to dive master quite quickly after that through rescue diver, and and enjoyed starting to work with assisting courses and guiding never really wanting to teach but just enjoying that i had a better skill level i still really had no idea what a good skill level was to be brutally honest i was a good dive master but of course we you know we did our in those days we'd do the lotus position you know vertical with your legs crossed for buoyancy control thinking how cool are we and um so it wasn't really until a couple of years later i realized that there was a whole different level to diving and it's staggering to me that I didn't know about it and I don't know why I didn't. I think maybe the internet wasn't as prominent or people weren't as prominent, but I saw Steve Bogart's video and of him doing a school session uh, in Mexico on a cenote and the guy was just, again, mesmerizing. He, you know, mm -hmm. he was in trim. He was doing skills. What He had two cylinders on his sides. So I thought, what is that? And, um, and then he was switching regulators and going upside down and on his side and completely motionless. Then he'd frog kick forwards and backwards. And I thought, I want to do that. It's and amazing. so... Uh, yeah, he's an amazing guy. I mean, I've interviewed him several times since and, and spoken to him a fair bit, but it was just, I don't know why I didn't know that that level existed, but I just never seen it. Mm. And so, you know, I kept investigating, found Steve Martin as well, another very, very good British side mount diver who's yeah. also been responsible for, you know, largely for the growth of side mount, um, in my opinion. He's done some just literally amazing things. So, you know, I thought, well, let's start to, let's start to figure this out. So I was actually, in, in those days, I was the uh, working in software as an executive in a software company living in America. 
and uh, had a fair amount of disposable income, it's fair to say. So it was a kind of a pleasant life, um, except that I, had, I was you know, in Silicon Valley, right? So living the dream there, if you want to call it that. <laughs> but it was, it was a hard grind, you know, you, you work long, long hours. But okay. I was able to sneak away every now and again, and I'd go on dive trips whenever I had business travel. And I decided that I wanted to do the Steve Bogarts thing, Steve Martin thing, and go and be a cave diver. So I went over to Mexico and trained. I thought I was going to train with Steve. Um, Steve and Jason Renault were partnering for a while, but that, that they fell out um, for, a, for a variety of reasons. So I ended up training with Jason Renault in Mexico and both side mount and uh, in uh, intro to cave level. And that just changed my world. Yeah. It was yes. um, it was a tough tough first couple of days. He got me in the water. It was funny, you know. And, and I was a, I had a lot of dives. I made by this time maybe two and a half thousand. You know, a lot of dives. But at the dive master open water level, you know, kind of like, well, you dive still master keep your kind of. Uh, no, no. I mean, no. I never, I never logged a dive beyond my first. And of course, when I got to dive master, they, yeah, they said, oh, "Where's your logbook?" And I said, "I don't have a logbook." And uh, and they said, "Well, you've got to show. You've got to be able to show us that you've done sixty dives." And so I thought, "Oh, really?" And uh, and I uh, and I had people who knew me, and I had video and well, not video, I had Im images of us diving and shots of us holding crayfish and that sort of thing. But ultimately, <laughs> I was able That's to get fun, by guys. and. <laughs> so I had to kind of start the whole log book again, again, thanks to Shearwater, I, every dive gets logged now, but if it was up to me writing a log, I still wouldn't be doing it. So no. yeah, I'm hopeless at that. So anyhow, so i um, trained with Jason and just, uh, just loved it and learned about trim, learned about propulsion, learned about cave diving, learned about side mount and then just said about it. Um, after that, I didn't get to do a lot of cave diving with the Jenny Springs once, but really spent a lot of time focusing on my diving because I realized there was another level. And one thing I, I it actually, it was a kind of a, an epiphany for me as well is that the better I got, the more I was enjoying my diving. Mm. And I think there's a lesson for everybody, <clears throat> excuse me, is, is like work on, your, work on your dive skills because when you're a better diver, it's a lot more fun. And there's a lot of people who dive and they yeah. don't dive particularly well and they're okay with that, which is, which is fine. But for me, That's it was really the better I got, the more thing. I could see. When you actually think about it, that's actually really quite a basic thing, but and then, but it makes so much sense. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, work on your skills. I mean, don't make it so that it's a grind for you, but work to get better, but then make sure you're working mm -hmm. on the right things. So make sure you get some, find a, find a good instructor. I mean, there's so many people in the UK and Europe that you know, I know of, I know Gary Dallas, is, he's one of my favorite guys in Sidemount and Steve Martin and others, but there are many, many divers in, in um, the UK who can teach you how to do it properly. And that's kind of what you need to learn to like do a course with them and then go away, even if it's a, just to do a couple of workshops with them. If you don't want certifications, they're not as important. And then go away and practice those skills and get better. And, you know, the things, obviously, the foundations are, you know, um, buoyancy control, trim, balance, what I call stability. And being stable in the water, being able to be still, being able to propel yourself properly. It's really great to be able to go backwards. That's kind of, um, you know, the back kick is just such a, great thing for your diving for photography for maneuvering in tight spaces it changes your world and it also means it makes it easier for you to hold levels as well sometimes as you achieve higher levels and you're starting to do ascents um it's, you find yourself crashing into each other swimming around in circles What's because you can't hold a position that? um well that's a, yeah that's a really good question because choice of fins really depends a lot on your holistic system so you know, if you're diving uh, and also a little bit on your body. So if you have, like a lot of guys have very heavy legs. So wearing yeah. heavy fins with heavy legs tends to drop you down um, and make mm. you your head high. Um, having said that, um, you know, a lot, certainly when you're tech diving, you tend to want to use a tech fin. Um, you certainly, you know, split fins have become kind of a no-no. I, I dive split fins for a long time as a dive master. <laughs> I, know, I know, I've still got them. I should, I should frame them and put them somewhere. Why don't you manage to Hail Marys or something? If you yeah. Exactly, exactly. But they, I uh, love my V12s, you know, they were, they were very cool and I could go very faster than I thought. But of course, they're not much good for tech diving in terms of frog kicking and back kicking. And, and they're, I guess they're a bit of a hazard with lines too. But um, sort of I digress a bit. So you sort of asked the question about fins. So you've really got to look at it from the point of view of getting in the water with your system and trying a few different types of fins on and seeing 
what effect it has on your trim. It's really interesting to see how buoyant they are and then try them on and see what it does. Mm -hmm. And so as part of an overall system, your fins are certainly part of that. The weight tends to be a long way from your center of gravity and buoyancy. So you really do want to pay a bit of attention. Um, and also if you're in fresh or salt water, that will make a difference as well. Salt making things a lot more buoyant. So um, certainly, you know, I, I, I dive a relatively heavy pair of fins now, the Mara's um, power planners. And, but I have a set of Maris Quattros that I have sort of in my bag if I need them, especially going into caves and going back to wetsuits. Yeah. So, so okay. yeah. Mm, so I don't know, boy, I rabbited on for a while there, but there's, so what, I mean, what happened after sort of Mexico was a lot, two years of really just working on myself and trying to be a better diver. I did some courses of advanced nit nitrox and deco procedures. That also changes your diving, having the ability to go into decompression and not be afraid of the no, no decompression limit um, and knowing what to do and having the equipment and the training and the, and the redundancy or whatever it is that you need for that was, was great for me. I was diving, really diving side mount all of the time. So I, I refused to dive back mount from that point forward, uh, partly because I wanted to keep building my skills and partly because I really enjoyed it. So, um, and in the beginning, I was a bit of a, a mess, you know, and, but I gradually got better and better. Um, I learned to dive different environments, learned to dive cold water, dry suit, warm water, wet suit, salt water, fresh water, uh, aluminum cylinders, steel cylinders. So I got to oh. experience all of those things and then start to evolve into how do I deal with all of those. And uh, uh, you may know I have a, a relationship with the XD, uh, they, they sponsor my podcast, um, but I've been diving their equipment right from the very beginning. And so yeah. it's been for me great to be able to work with a particular um, sidebound harness and, and take it all the way through all of those different environments. So but when it got to, um, I ended my Sorry, um, I, role in, go ahead. Do you uh, test for them as well? No, I don't. No, so um, I'm just too far away. I, I think, you know, I'd love to do that for them. Um, but being in New Zealand versus Poland, uh, they've got so many great divers super close to them. And, mm -hmm. you know, Patrick Woodman's obviously in Mexico. So between Patrick and um, guys like Thomas Mishura and, and a few others, Gary Dallas does a little bit of work for them too, I think. Um, there's, you know, there's just so many great divers that they have close to hand where I they can good, easily ship. I think good though, isn't it? I think it's good that when you... Um you know, we're finding this as well. So you'll get like a few companies who you can start building a relationship with and getting to know their mm. products. Uh, you can then talk about them more. And because there is quite a few out there and, and then also to go to talk about a like post COVID time, you know, it's, it's strength in numbers and, you know, and it's kind of, you know, we're helping them getting the word out there about their products. They're helping us, you know, and it's kind of, hopefully we can all help each other in that sort of kind of yeah way. yeah well that's quite true this podcasting thing is super interesting because it takes a lot of time you know as we spoke in the beginning yeah. and and you know at some point you know for me i'd probably spend nearly 40 hours an episode you know i'm crazy about because i'm sort of rabid about sound quality and and i do a lot of editing um which not everybody does and not is not super necessary but I want my guests to sound awesome, you know, and not, not all of them are public speakers, obviously. So, so oh, really? sometimes they don't, <laughs> so sometimes know. they don't sound so awesome, you know? Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so it's really good to be able to, you know, to do that, but it takes a huge amount of time. And then I was thinking, gee, I really could be doing teaching more courses or I have a whole lot of other businesses. So I could be working on those. And so X deep support has been immense, but I've always been very mindful of my integrity and very mindful of, you know, Hey, you're only saying that because they're paying mm. you or giving you gear or so on. So you've got, it's a very fine line to walk in. And, and some, sometimes I prefer not to do it, but to be honest, I dive X deep gear anyhow. I dived it way back. You know, there isn't anything that I say that I didn't say yeah. before the podcast. You know, I've always loved yeah. their gear. And that's kind of the line I draw. You know, what do, I, do I love the gear? Um, would I dive it anyhow? Um, and, and the other thing I often say is, would I love to dive it? Maybe it's something I'm not using. I say, gee, I'd really like to use that. Then that's kind of the criteria. But, it, you know, it is a, a, bit of a, a bit of a challenge in terms of integrity because Sometimes I quite YouTube's like their fundamental. Mm. Sometimes I like their standards and it's not just like their, I can't mention names, but you know, you think, well, do you know what? They are really great products. I really like them. I've used them. I'm already a customer, but mm. actually when you drill down to the people who are in the, at the top, you know, they're actually excited because they're actually thinking about how are we going to evolve? How are we going to move diving onto that next level? 
what's coming out and there's you know through this there's some people who are thinking that way and i mm. think the covid thing was also an opportunity where it put a lot of people together forced people to get together to put their minds mm. together and sometimes you do need that and because if that hadn't happened that might not have occurred um so there's a positive if there's ever a positive from that you know it's you know and there's some there's some people we've got to know who you think wow you know oh i actually want to know more about what they're doing they've got targets that they're trying to work to um you know which are really good and they're trying to change the world and make diving sustainable you know which is mm. going forward this is how diving's got to be it's got to go hand in hand yeah. Well, there's one thing about diving. I mean, I don't know of another area where there's so many passionate people out there doing great things, you know, and yeah. sometimes it creates friction, but, but it, you know, if everyone sort of sees it as, Hey, we're in this holistic world where we're all in it together and we've all got our little slice of the pie that we can play with. And, and yeah, exactly. yeah it's, I think it's awesome. I just thought of one mm -hmm. coffee making. <laughs> well, you guys are all passionate about making your coffee. You, you're, your bristles, Indeed. you all get the best coffee yep. out there and you're the best coffee beaten. Indeed, indeed. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, as you may know, that's my other business, it's <laughs> coffee and gelato store here. And uh, it's, it is quite amazing. New Zealand's a crazy place. Like we, we're just crazy for coffee. And uh, it's not, the, the tragic thing with that is as crazy as we are, the coffee here is not always great. And I used to say that it was, but it's not, it's got quite plainly and so yeah you know, when you when you find a good one then that tends to be the place you go and so when we opened our store we thought actually it was going to be a dive center this is the crazy thing found a really? block of land i thought i'm doing i'm doing a dive center and uh, and then i sort of looked around and thought mm, it's going to be a really hard grind here you know oh, imagine now covid we would have been open for a couple of years and probably okay and i think i could make it successful now but you know that town had no coffee shop um, it, and it didn't really need a dive center. So we thought, let, let's fix the coffee thing. And it's, and for me, I'm a business guy from way back. So starting a business is nothing. So I thought, yeah, I know how to do this. And, and so we started the coffee shop, not just really having been home baristas before that. Do you have, a shelf, training, of course. The, do you have a shelf or a wall that's got Finn's mask in the coffee shop? Right? <laughs> we should do that. Yeah. I should, you yeah, haven't. even, even hiring. <laughs> no, you, we, you haven't. I can't believe you have it. Oh, no. Oh, it has some fins up there, you know, get your Great coffee, idea. grab your fins as you go. Yeah, yeah, we could have a little higher service. The beach is only 150 metres away, so um, yeah, they could grab a set oh, of fins right, and masks. There we and, go. <laughs> that's the idea of the day. I'm gonna, we'll give that to you, Ian. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so do you, how do you um, kind of balance your time through teaching and your businesses? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's really challenging because you know the coffee shop, and then we've just started um, a year ago. We started some deluxe studios behind them as a luxury accommodation, and then we've now got another block of land and maybe another one that we are. I'm thinking of building a bar on it. Would you believe? Awesome. And um, only because again, this it's not so much that I'm enamoured by that. I mean, I like going to nice bars and stuff, but there's no, there isn't one here, and the place really needs it. And and there's a whole group of people who what town are you um, in uh, well, i'm in a place called cooper's beach in doubtless bay so it's in the far north of new zealand so we're kind of very much a tourist town but there's there's a standing population of about five thousand people here and that swells dramatically with people coming in and out of holiday homes and we're on the path to the far north um cape Brianga, which is where the there's a beautiful lighthouse there it's where the pacific meets the tasman sea so it's quite dramatic coastline and beautiful scenery. All the beaches are amazing. And so it's a cool place and, and a really neat place to live. The local um, people here are amazing. Oh, awesome. But yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, it, and it's very good diving, relatively close by. And then great diving um, about an hour south is where the Canterbury Wreck is and about two hours south is where the Port Knights Islands are. So I'm easily able to like do a run around all of those. So back to Gemma's question, you know, we, the coffee shop, takes a lot of time in itself. The accommodation takes a lot of time. New businesses take a lot of time. Then I've got the podcast. Then I've got um, some patrons and I do work for them. So I'm doing extra videos for them and live streams. And then on top of that, I do a bit of dive instruction and also my own diving. And so I started uh, a year ago diving because free breather. So I've been a uh, sidewinder. I've been working really hard on building hours on that. Yeah. And during COVID, obviously I haven't been teaching at all. I've got a course I think coming up in August. So I sort of weave in courses and I'm not doing a lot of courses. I probably do about a course a month before COVID. 
And so that to me, it's sort of quality over quantity. And there's a lot of people in the world who are you know, full on dive, you know, teaching diving, that's all they do. And they just, they're pounding out courses. And many of them are very, very good at it. I don't think that would work so well for me, just personally. I love it where I can get a, get a lot of diving in for myself and work on my own skills and still be, you know, be at a really high standard. But when I'm teaching, it's kind of almost like, yeah, hey, great. I get to do a course now because it's yeah. something that's come over and above everything else. And so for me, it's a real pleasure every time I'm teaching one and it never feels like a grind because I'm not doing too many. Now, not everyone's in that situation. I'm not saying it's the best way either. There's an element of building your skill as an instructor mm. and the more courses you teach, yeah. uh, perhaps the better you're going to be. But um, I work really hard on my skills as an instructor as well. Um, I've done a lot of public speaking, a lot of instruction before teaching. I taught physics and it's good that you're a still involved. Ago. It's good that you're mm. still involved with teaching. It's good that you're still getting fired up as well. You know, that, you know, yeah. it's get, it's, for students, there'd be nothing worse, you know, go back to school, to, you know, and your maths teacher was bored because he wanted to be somewhere else, you know, mm. Uh, mm. You know and you want that because, you, you know, as, as dive masters and instructors, we're on show, aren't we? We're, we're exactly. you know, we're leading by example. And if our students look at us and go, well, he's not excited about diving, why are we both? And mm. you think, well, we've got far up, far in the learn exactly. to dive. Yeah, yeah. I spoke to PJ Prinsloo a bit about that. And it's kind of this whole thing of role modeling and it's inspirational to your students and in making sure that you're empathetic. You know, there's so many aspects that go into instructing that make it really interesting if you want to be at the upper level of instructors. So, you know, if I look at some of the very best, and I have, um, you know, I trained, I mentored with Tom Steiner and just, oh my God, you know, just watching that guy and watching how calm he is. And he has his way, you know, I'm not the same as Tom, but just I learned from him how to be calm when you're teaching. And mm. that was, because you see a lot of instructors that get somewhat frustrated and, and maybe even <laughs> upset when things aren't going their way and having someone with you who just, no matter what's going on, songs are safe, of course. He's just super calm, you know, and he's giving and very clear instructions and not too many, you know, there's a lot there. It is, and it's amazing when you do find someone like that who kind of, who inspires you and impresses you uh, and you think, wow, you know, that's to be like that would be awesome, you know, someday. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's exactly it. Uh, and you sound like a person that you always want to keep learning, learning, learning. So have you, what, what have you got on the Yeah. Top? Yeah, for me, so now that I've um, started diving the Kiss Sidewinder, so the, the, all the paths sort of lead down that side, Mount Rebreather side. So at the moment, I'm uh, advanced on the Kiss Sidewinder 45 hours. So I can dive it to 40 or 45 meters, I think, on with air diluent. And so I'd really, I desperately want to take that into caves and I want to take a little deeper. So uh, those, those are the two next steps. So there's always for me a next step, you know, and eventually I don't think I'll go real deep with it. I think 60 meters or 65 will be fine. So I'm saying to take it into that trimix zone. There's um, some wrecks and truck lagoon that I want to go and dive with it. Yeah. And then I definitely want to dive it in caves. So there's a, there's a, a course that you need to do. You need to qualify on the rebreather, do a certain number of hours, and then you can go and repeat your cave training skills in the rebreather and get certified to dive it in caves. So that'll be the next thing for me, along with the Normoxic yeah. trimix on it. So, so we, we and, have tanks either side. Yeah, yeah. The beauty of the Sidewinder is it's pretty much my existing side mount system. So you've got um, two cylinders, j exactly the same as you would uh, normally, just with the addition of of one extra hose on my right side, which plugs into my diluent and becomes an offboard diluent for the rebreather. And everything else is the same. Um, obviously, it's not identical diving, but in terms of my harness is very much the same, cylinders the same, and then the rebreather just sits on top of it. It was a it was a big thing about for me and as to why I chose that particular rebreather. And I'm I'm definitely zigging left when everyone in New Zealand is zagging right. You know, everyone here dives an AP or a JJ. So yeah. you know, I've, there's literally I can't tell you how many of my friends all dive Christine, a different unit. That's what I'm she dives on as well. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, exactly. So I'm very much, you know, in, in a different camp here and the only one diving a Sidewinder and there's a small KISS group here. Um, and so, I, you know, I cop a bit of flack, but I, I like being a bit different as well. And I always wanted to stay with side mount. And so the Sidewinder has given me the ability to do that. I've got Can amazing training. Can you get parts from... and everything okay over there? Yeah, yeah, I can ship them in. So there's no no great problem shipping and I've got a little parts kit with me. But, you know, yeah. so far nothing's really broken and it's just a, a bit of um, 
little lube for it is all I've had to buy. So yeah, I got great, great training from Ed Sorensen in Florida, who's well, yeah, one of the gurus on the sidewinder. And I'm seeing it, mind you, a lot of people are jumping on it now. You know, Patrick Woodward right. diving it now. Audrey Cadell, um, uh, Christina dives it. Christina Zanato. Yeah. Um, there's yeah. a bunch. So a bunch of not just good divers, great divers diving it. So I need, well, to, I need to, yeah, yeah, and I need to get good enough so I can be in it. <laughs> Start to talk in the same breath as those guys. So I'm getting the actually. It's, I'm diving quite well now. So that you go through an interesting experience on the changeover. That's for sure. Amazing. It's just, yeah, it mm. just shows you, you just have to keep learning, learning, learning. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's always something else. I mean, Tom Steiner, you know, again, the guy, I don't know, I think he's done 10,000 dives and been teaching for 20, 30 years, whatever it is. It's a huge amount of time. Immense skill set, you know, like not just an average skill set, immense. And every year he does something, you know, whether it's a, he will go and do a rescue course, or he will go and do a medic course, or he will go and do something that improves him. And, and his thing as well, you can always learn something more. It's, you know, there's always something more to learn. And, there is. Uh, so yeah. are you a wreck diver or are you a cave diver? That is such an interesting where, question. Where would you I, be? Yeah, I, I probably am a wreck diver who dives caves, but I'm not like Pete Mesley is a good friend here. And Pete Mesley is definitely a, a wreck diver <laughs> who just happened to do some cave diving and he, he still kind of reluctant i guess you know he's been down a bit of exploration now. Seems to be down one, yeah 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 and I, I mean there's not a lot of caves in new zealand that are easy to dive but the caves that are here in the south island and they're super gnarly they're super cold very dark very deep and so there's not a lot of cave diving opportunities close to me mount gambia in australia is probably the best opportunity and i went there last year had an amazing time and i was planning to be back there right now so that will be a, an annual or maybe biannual trip for me yeah, to Mount Gambia to dive caves. But then I, I can wreck dive, you know, almost every day, every week here on the Canterbury and some of the other wrecks that are here. Um, I'm going down to the Lermontov with Pete um, in October, which is a Russian cruise liner that was sunk in the Marlborough Sounds, which is just an immense part of New Zealand, amazing area. I was just there last week with some friends and that is a, that's a real wreck. You know, that's one that was sunk accidentally, fallen on its side amazing so i can't wait for that so i think i if to answer the question in a in a short way i'm a wreck diver who dives caves but i love both uh you was an engineer on the canterbury um what was it like when you first dived there you know you've been you've been on this ship for quite a while and now you're gonna dive and, and i've got two questions what was it first like to dive and two you know did you recapture that first dive experience when you first got in the water with your stepfather and you, you know about that you know when you first saw underwater was that did you regain that yeah great questions and yes yes and yes so it was an amazing experience so i unfortunately was in germany when the ship was sunk so i never got to watch the actual sinking and that would have been in itself quite an emotional experience i think okay. i served on Served on Canterbury for six years, but I also served on another ship, um, HMNZS Wellington, for, for several years, which used to be HMS Bacanti. And so the New Zealand Navy bought it from the Royal Navy, and I was actually on the original crew of that ship. So I spent a lot of time on that class of ship and knew it inside out. And so, uh, and had a real attachment to Canterbury. It was my first ship and my last ship in the Navy. Um, I started on it as an apprentice engineer and finished as the chief engineer or the marine engineer officer. So in charge of the whole engineering um, plant and everything on the ship. And so when I got in the water on that dive, I was sort of, it was, yeah, I was a bit apprehensive and there's this old feeling and, you know, the old salts in the Navy, you never want to see a ship on the bottom sort of thing. And but having said that, I was a diver. And so as much as I sort of loved Canterbury in my time in the Navy, it was a great ship to serve on and a very good, very good. That class of ship just was one of the most successful classes of ship ever built. There were, I think, 35 or so of them built, which was amazing for that, for that sort of ship. And so, but I'm a diver. And so I thought, yeah, okay, let's go and have a look. And so um, it's sunk in about, the, it sits in between 32 and 36 meters of water, but the foremast is only 14 meters from the surface. 
and it's in a very right. sheltered bay, which, and this was a smart part about it. A lot of wrecks in New Zealand have been sunk in locations where they've been destroyed by the weather. And so this was sunk in a very, very sheltered bay. And so I went down and the foremast comes into view really quickly. You know, it's only 14 meters down. And so I saw the foremast and then you start to see the superstructure. So I saw the foremast, then the funnel, which is just after there, and then the main mast, which is just after again. And then you start to see oh, one deck and the bridge top. And it was, I can't, I can't really describe it. I tried to describe it a little in the book as well. It was this feeling of, you know, a little bit of nostalgia, a little bit of awe, a little bit of shock, a little bit of, okay, this is what Canterbury is now. But in my mind, you know, Canterbury served for th over 30 years in the New Zealand Navy and it continues to serve now. It is the most amazing purpose sunk wreck um, that I've dived. It's um, got everything, you know, it's got holes cut in it. So it's relatively easy to penetrate for new wreck divers, but you can go right to the bottom of it and you are in a full overhead with super silty and bits of cable and machinery. And, and so, you know, depending on where you go, you can have an experience from an absolute beginner. You know, an open water diver could almost dive it. They tend to want advanced open water because of the depth mm -hmm. it ultimately gets to. But even without wreck certifications, you can swim around the outside. It's they put um, the the local Maori tribes. Uh, they're called iwi. They um, pronounced a rahui over it, which means it's a no take zone. And they usually do that to replenish fish stocks. But when they've been overfished, they say, "Okay, rahui now." Or if somebody dies in the water or something like that happens, there'll be a rahui for a period of time while they deal with that. But in this case, it was about creating this marine environment around the Canterbury Wreck and replenishing everything. And the bay had been quite fished, uh, fished quite heavily. And Canterbury coming back became the structure within which fish could hide. So the bait fish came in, kelp grew on it at, at the relatively high levels. Um, and then the bigger fish came and then fish found their home inside. Then crayfish came. Yeah. Um, there's any, uh, yeah, the marine life is immense on it now. You know, you go inside, there's big eyes everywhere. There's snapper inside there, which are the, the, the most pro, um, sought after eating fish in New Zealand. But it's, it's full of big snapper. There's really large kingfish inside there, all kind of feeding mm -hmm. on it. It's amazing. And outside there's jewel and enemies and they spawn twice a year, um, timed on the, uh, the moon and the tides. And again, you can watch the spawning activity of these beautiful anemones um, that range in color from orange to pinks to, um, to purples. So it's, it's an amazing wreck. Um, so what, what made you write the book? The book, well, what, what frustrated me, so I'd go there and I'd sort of mention the foremast, funnel, mainmast, and, and then I'd, and I'd mention various compartments that I was diving, because I recognized everything. You know, you go in there and you go, yeah, okay, yeah, I remember this. I, I know every, you know, every rivet on that ship. So everywhere I went, I knew pretty much where I was occasionally. I go, oh, which electrical compartment am I, am I in now? And then, ah, I'm in this one. Yeah, so even the, the ones that are outside my parlance, I know what they are. And I'd hear people call them the wrong names, and I'd hear people struggle with, where they were in the wreck and not really knowing anything about it as well about its history and so I thought look how about I write a book that kind of described the ship and sort of talked about it from the point of view of here's a little bit of the history and here's a few stories personal stories that I or my experiences of being on the ship and some things that happened in each space so I sort of started in the bow work my way to the stern and then work my way down the decks as well and didn't describe every compartment but I described a lot of them in the book, talking about the history, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and also talking a little bit about, okay, so if I refer to something, I had a sort of a big glossary in the front, which had even naval ranks in there, so you knew what oh. I was talking about. I had all the abbreviations that we use. And so the book sort of starts that way and describes the, the history of the ship and then describes the compartments of the ship. Mm -hmm. And then I talk about, well, how are we going to dive this? You know, so if you're an entry level wreck diver, how would you dive this wreck and where might you go to, to, to get a really, you know, some interesting routes. And then if you're an intermediate level and you want to start to penetrate the wreck, how would you do that? And here's some routes. And then if you're an advanced, you know, wreck diver and you really want to have a, a explore on this wreck and see some of the spaces that, um, uh, in my mind, the most interesting, especially the machinery spaces, which are very low down, um, being in, in fully enclosed, then here's how you dive those. And I'm still doing that to this day. I, I sort of keep making new projects for myself. So I wrote the book on that basis. It's been um, I wouldn't say like super successful as a book. It sold a lot of copies, but it has a very, very limited market here in New Zealand of people who are interested in this particular wreck. There are a few yeah. others sunk that are the same class, the Waikato here. There's the Swan in Australia and the Scylla, which is off the coast of Plymouth, um, is also the same class of ship 
Um, so the book is relevant to those as well, but um, it's pr pr primarily about the Canterbury. And so the book it, did it, you know, served its purpose. It got that scratch that itch for me. Um, I really enjoyed writing it. It's been great to sell a few copies, and 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 also it sort of built my profile a little way back, which was good too. I mean, I wrote this in 2015, 16 now, I think. So that's been good. But I've been video, I've been creating video projects now where I'm going through and videoing, you know, routes yeah. and and doing a bit of guiding. I guided the guy last weekend through it, and I was surprised how much i enjoyed it he's a really good diver said so that was that helped but part of it was just the fun of being able to go through it and we, we said we'd go to these spaces and then we go to another 15 or 20 spaces as well because we've got more time uh yeah. that was a lot of fun yeah that's good amazing yeah mm. yeah it must be great for you know people that have also served on it if they become a diver and yeah they can experience what you've experienced yeah, exactly. Yeah, and the book, the, the idea of the book, and also, look, a little lesson for wreck divers is one of the principles of diving a new wreck is you should research the wreck. You should learn about it as much as you possibly can and certainly understanding, you know, which way it faces, how deep it is, what the, what the structure's like, you know, where certain compartments are, where the openings are, um, is, a, is a really great research project before you dive any wreck. Mm. And so, you, you know, I, I sort of built it so that if people wanted to get into wreck diving, it was a good um, intro to the Canterbury wreck. And then some old salts of water who never dive, but just wanted to reminisce about the ship a little. <laughs> so it's been, it's been cool. It's been very cool. Yeah, that's good. So have you got any wrecks around the world that you haven't dived that you would like to go to? Oh, so many, so many. <clears throat> and it's not, not even, look, I haven't scratched the surface. I've been to Truck Lagoon, so I'm very fortunate to have done that. And I've dived some wrecks off um, clear water in Florida and, and, in, um, and off of uh, Fort Lauderdale as well, which are purpose sunk. So there's a few of the purpose sunks I'd really like to do. Um, yeah. I'm, you know, I'm getting a little old in the tooth for like working my way up to 120 meter dives to do some of the real exploration sort of stuff, you know, the Britannic and, and the Lusitania. And then there's two wrecks in New Zealand, the Niagara and the um, Pereri, who uh, they're just too deep for me now. Um, I could probably do it. Yeah, I could build my way up to it. Why but I think you say that? Um, well, it's, it's really just the, the, the level of training required and I'd need to be doing this on the sidewinder. I'd need to make some adjustments to that equipment. And look, I think we have to be really honest about technical diving as you go deeper as well. Um, it's in my mind, relatively safe diving in that 65 meter range when you've done the training and you've got the equipment every five or 10 meters you go deeper than that. You're really starting to lift the risk significantly mm -hmm. and yeah. it's not, it's not that it can't be done safely. Of course it can mean there's many people doing it every day, but as you then pass a hundred meters and go into the hundred to 150 meter range, you're, it's, you're starting to do some really serious shit, you know, and you it's fitness, uh, not, not fitness. I'm super, I'm as, almost as fit as I was when I was in my twenties. So it's, yeah, yeah. But there is, there is the element of decompression stress as you're getting older as well and thinking about managing yeah. that, you know, so I'm, I'm not saying it's a young man's game and that you can't do it. I'm 58 this year. So it's not that I'm that old either, but and super fit for what I am, you know, so I'm very comfortable with the diving I'm doing, but I'm also saying, listen, there are so many wrecks in that sub 65 meter range. I just mm -hmm. have to get myself to an amoxic trimix. So I can go back to truck lagoon and dive the San Francisco Maru, which sits in about 55 meters, the OET destroyer, which is in the 65, maybe, maybe a little bit 70 range. So there's a lot of diving that you can do that sits in that range, which, you know, as I said, is kind of for me, is a bit more comfortable if you look well, at it that way. I, I always, as a measure, I try and visualize. Um, a hundred meter is a hard thing to visualize. So mm. Big Ben uh, at Westminster, mm -hmm. that's a hundred meters high. And mm. you think when we talk about these people, you know, Jack Cousteau did the Britannic on air, not just mm. once, but a few times. And you think, boy, that's, that's incredible. That's, he is. was doing even more more than that you know um, yeah yeah, yeah look I, I mean the I, I the sad the sad thing is yeah. many of the pioneers perish doing that as well you know yeah. so it's not it's not you know, i spoke to brian kaycock about this on the last interview i did with him and he said look some of the diving he was doing he doesn't know how he survived it you know it just, he just put it down to luck and it, it very much you know the days of very deep air diving were were some you know like diving in the uh, death zone on in the himalayas as well you know, diving um climbing mm -hmm. so you know you we have better ways of doing that now 
Um, but even so, it doesn't completely eliminate the risk. And, and there's just the training required too. And then the build up to those dives, you know, you don't just go and say, hey, I'm going to dive 120 meters. I did, I did, a, I did a hypoxic course. I can go and do that now. You know, you really need to, to build up, be part of a team. And I love the, the concept of team diving, but it's just, I just don't see it. I just, there's just so many other things for me to do that are shallower that I can still be pushing things. I mean, I still, I love going into, you know, small spaces and wrecks and doing those sort of things. I love small spaces and caves. I'm not a big restriction grinder, but I don't, I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm built for it. You know, I'm, I'm the guy who can, who can go through that stuff. So I, I don't, I don't mind that so much. Um, and, and so if I'm going to be pushing the limits, it's going to be more in, you know, caves and wrecks okay. in that sort of 65 meter range or less. So, so tell us about your podcast. Yeah, you know, you've been yeah. doing that a while. I know we did. Yeah, touch yeah, I on started. It. Yeah, well, it's interesting because podcasting's been around a while, right? Since rough vaguely two thousand and nine, and there were a few really prominent podcasts that that have came come and gone. And I was I listened to Joe Rogan for a while. You know, he's he's an interesting guy, and there's sometimes some cool stuff on there. And yeah. I it was before this big explosion that's kind of happened over COVID. You know, and just before this, we are now we're getting a lot of podcasts coming. There weren't very many around. And for me, I kind of needed to scratch a bit of an itch because I'd set up these other businesses outside of diving, but I really wanted to be working in diving and I just hadn't quite figured it out. So there was an element of scratching an itch for me. There was also an element of, um, when I had my initial discussions with XDeep about it, they said, oh, look, do a general one, do a general one on tech diving. And they were much more on board with supporting that because XDeep's not just a side mount company. They're a complete across the board, you know, single cylinder back mount, double cylinder back mount, regulators for both side mount and, and yeah. back mount. So they're not just a side mount company at, at all. And so they were much more keen for me to be doing that. And to be honest, they would have supported me to a greater level um, had I done that. But I didn't feel like I was the guy. Um, I, there, I wasn't the guy to be talking about all of tech diving because I'm not experienced in all of tech diving and I'm not, I don't dive back mount and I didn't buy it in those days, didn't dive rebreathers or back mount rebreathers. So I didn't feel like I was the right guy for that. And one thing I've learned in business as well is, is you're dealing with a niche is, can be really, really positive. It means that your market's much smaller, but what you find in a niche is that they tend to be quite rabid. And I kind of describe side mount divers as a little bit rabid sometimes in that they're super passionate about it. You know, you kind of get into side mount diving, you either, you either love it or hate it, but if you love it, you really love it. Yeah. And so the Facebook groups were, were really busy, and, but there was a lot of misinformation and a lot of people in there trying to put their hand up out of the kind of the, you know, the, the group and say, hey, look at me, you know, I know all of this. And some of them did, and some of them in my mind didn't. So, you know, you get keyboard divers on, on Facebook groups as well. So no. everyone had an opinion. And, and we weren't, in my mind, we weren't hearing the real opinions, the opinions of what I consider to be the best divers. And so I thought, what about if I did a podcast on side mount diving? Because I thought there would, number one, I thought there would be an audience. I thought they would be engaged. And I wasn't sure, what I wasn't sure about was, could I, could I contact Steve Bogarts, who has, has never met me, and say, hey, Steve, will you come on my show? And I, made, I wanted to get Steve early because he was kind of the guy who got me into it. And that story would work well as we discussed it with each other. And it was interesting. It, he instantly came back and said yes. And Steve's an extremely generous guy with his time, speaks all around the world, a great speaker, a great talker. Yeah. Um, which is great for interviewing because you know you don't have to do very much you know you just kind of pull his chain a bit and throw a couple of couple of little guidance questions in and away he goes i'm probably the same right so and so i got him on and in the beginning of the it was quite cold in the beginning you know we had no relationship and and so he was yeah how are you steve oh, yeah i'm good you know and and uh and so i had to kind of build this rapport with him over the over the um episode but what i found was as i asked him what I'm sure he considered to be the right questions. Mm. He warmed to me and he warmed to the experience of doing the podcast. And at the end of it, you know, we, we kind of went on and I've just done another interview with Steve, which went for two hours, you know? So normally I try and keep mine to an hour. And so it was just because, you know, we, we engaged and now we know each other. And so it was so much better. And, and so what surprised me a little bit was, you know, the Steve Bogarts, the Jill Hyneths, the Christina Zanatos, the, um, Steve Lewis, uh, look, there's just so many, I'll, I'll miss a bunch of them, uh, Thomas Mishura, everybody was super generous with their time and was really this? giving. Yeah, 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 amazing. So this is, this is our set, this is our plan, and these mm -hmm. are, 
these were our questions and we ha we're kind of like um well we haven't gone through all of them put it that way <laughs> <laughs> that's been you my chain you see <laughs> so that's been brief. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. Um, well, I long maintained just one more thing, Ian. I, I long maintained yeah. that yeah, divers love two things they love diving and they like talking shit about diving, right? So, it so it's so really true. if you give it that social aspect of just hey, we're just having a conversation, there should be a beer or a wine or a coffee or something involved as well, then it goes really well. So, so what, what do you what's your post dive food? You know, what do you like after a dive? <laughs> uh, it's, well, look, I, I love a beer after a dive. But yeah. that's usually a little bit later. Um, in in Goza, when we were there, there was always the gelato or the gelati after the dive. So often if we're diving the inland sea, there's a little ice cream store there. So you'd go and grab one of those. Um, I tend to, like I'm waiting, let me think where we go. So Northland Dive, there's always a, a kind of this post-dive, clean all your gear up, come back, grab a beer or a wine, sit down, get some snacks out and start looking at your images or your, or your video and start talking yeah. about the dives. And they've got a big long table they do that on, um, which is made out of macro carpro. It's beautiful. And so everyone sits there um, before they shower, before they do anything else, you know, fires back one beer, get you know, some chips and nuts and whatever, cheese boards. And then nice. we're talking about awesome. the dives, looking, did we get some good pictures? Did we get some good video? Showing each other what you've got. Oh, look, there's you there. And so that's kind of tends to be, I love that. I also loved the Gozo when we were there. We'd have a beer there sometimes, but often we just sit around the table and talk about diving afterwards. And where's your was, chili level? That's what, what, what we all want to know. Where's my... Don't worry about your diving. Where's your chili level? My chili level. I'm very mid, very middle of the road, right? So I don't I quite like saying, spicy food. I think, I think I could do a madras. I made a mistake cool. once when I was silly in the Navy. I, um, I had no money one night and went out for dinner and I, uh, I said I would eat a uh, bowl of chili paste there from a Thai restaurant, which um, mm. I suffered dramatically for over the next two days. I won't, I won't give you the gory details, but uh, yeah, not recommended. So I've been kind of somewhat, somewhat dragged back from that, from that day. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, should we start with the questions then that we've, Go ahead, go ahead. You. So the first question is, have you got anywhere that you would, is still on your bucket list to dive to and why? Yes, I do. Um, and a lot of these come up with op opportunities that have fallen my way. I always wanted the dive truck lagoon. That one's done now. The next one, I really, the next place I really want to go is with Brian K. Cook in the Bahamas um, to the caves of Abaco, Crystal Caves there. I've spoken to Brian three or four times about them. I've seen pictures and video. I spoke to Steve Bogarts about his exploration there with Brian as well. That's a must go for me. So that's early, that's very early in the post COVID international yeah. travel yeah, list. Um, we'll get that one done. And then I've got an offer to go to Greece with Stratus Cast as well. And also back to Sardinia, which I've, I've done um, in Sardinia. Toddy does a cave camp where you dive underground. He teaches you how to put all, all your, all your camping equipment into oh, wow. a tube that you then dive into the cave. Oh, yeah, camp underground. Yeah, yeah. So, and Toddy's kind of a real. He's 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 German, and he's he, there's a lot of German engineering goes into everything that guy does. And so he, um, he, it's all everything's precision, and I love the idea of that. So I'm pretty sure I'll go back to Toddy's cave camp and do that mm -hmm. and dive the caves of Sardinia again. I want to dive with Stratus Cast in the caves of Greece as well. But I think Brian's going to win win first in um, Abaco. I just have to get. Yeah, we've heard that spoken about before. Yeah. Um, mm. So, have you got a favourite marine animal, and why? Yes, orca, um, 100%. Why they're just so immense, so beautiful, so everything that I love about the marine environment: streamlined, intelligent. Uh, I love dolphins too. Uh, they're kind of mini orca, I guess. But we see them here. Um, I, I was fortunate enough to be on a boat that they came up to the back of the boat and hung out with us for a while and I filmed it. And uh, not in the water though. So I've, I've, I'd love to find an opportunity to be in the water with them. We're actually not allowed to jump in with them. Mm. Um, but I think um, if that ever happens, that would be, that would make my life almost. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah. Can you um, give us three people who you choose to dive with or snorkel uh, if they can't dive? And you can choose anyone from history now. Or oh, well, Jacques, yeah, Jacques Cousteau would be at the top of the list then. Absolutely, I'd love to dive with him. Uh, there's some of the early cave explorers, but I'd love, you know, there's Sheik Exley and those guys, I think would that would be pretty amazing as well. So let's say Jacques, Jacques Cousteau, 
on a wreck dive, Shaq yeah. Exley on a on a cave dive, um, and then you know what? I think I'd go for it. I'd love to go for a dive with Tom Steiner again, um, and oh. the Open Water Sea somewhere. That guy's amazing to dive with. So there you go. Good yeah, choice. Yeah. And what's your favourite piece of dive kit? What's the one piece of dive kit you can't do without? Yeah, it'd be, it would be my X Deep Stealth 2.0 Tech. Um, that is the foundation of everything. You know, I love the rigs I have and so on. But yeah, when I'm when I'm diving, uh, I've got a good dry suit too, so that's tough. But I'd say I'd say that because I'll dive that in a wetsuit as well. When I put that on, I know I'm ready to dive, and and I can put it on with my eyes shut now. You know, the whole. I remember when I trained on it, trying to remember what to do when was a bit of a challenge yeah. for me but now i put it on like a coat and what dry suit uh, have you got i've got an sf tech uh, dry suit from switzerland so um yeah very very good suit love it um and so it's been custom fitted for me and so that's yeah it's a, another great tool of choice for me and what can dive computer do you swear by uh she, oh, shear water 100 percent. so yeah. uh, again you know, sort of hands up shear water have supported me in my diving and, and with the podcast but uh, I had a pet, I've still got a petrol that I bought in 2013 that, um, it doesn't get dived a lot now because it's been superseded by a Tarek and, uh, and a nerd. Oh, right. and, nice. oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, they're amazing. So she ordered a hundred percent of that. You know, I, I know um, Bruce and Lynn having met them in truck and they're not only do they do great equipment, but they're an immense company in terms of supporting their products and innovating. They've just released a new recreational yeah. uh, computer this week. And they're just always innovating. Uh, yeah, love them. I love them as a company. I like what they're all about, and including their equipment. Yeah, yeah, good quality. I've got a uh, Pernix. Um, yeah, oh, it's yeah. really nice and clear underwater. Yeah, and use it's good. Okay, last question for you. Um, so you've got a billboard, okay? And we ask this of everybody, okay? So mm -hmm. you've got a billboard, uh, and you can put a message, a question, an image, a statement, whatever you like. But you want to get the message out to the billions of people out there. What are you yeah. going to put on it? Wow. It's a tough one. Yeah, so I'm a, I'm a bit of a weird guy sometimes. I love the whole passionate and be exciting and positive. But one of the sayings that lives with me to this day from my military days is the definition of discipline. It's uh, doing what needs to be done when it needs to be done, whether you like it or not. And I kind of live my life a little bit on with that. Um, it's not yeah. necessarily a super positive message, but it's a great way to get shit done. Trust me. Organize, so if you're, yeah, it, yeah, organization, definitely. Yeah. I yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, it's good. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So yeah, but there are questions that we, yeah, always ask our, our guests. So have you got any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, I'd, I'd love, actually, so given that, well, giving me the floor, that's awesome. So I'd love to know more about why you set your podcast up and and uh, and how it's going. And I'm super excited to see sort of a, a more gen generic or general podcast on, on diving and also one that started by someone very new to diving um, and yourself, you know, with Ian there, who's been diving for a while. I think it's really exciting to have um, the passion of people coming into diving. Sometimes you forget about what that's like way back. So, yeah. yeah. I yeah, so yeah, why, why did you start and how's it going? Well, Ian obviously had the idea, but I think you know, both of us, it's just about sharing and putting it out there to try and get more people to try it because I think it's seen as kind of not always the most accessible sport, and especially for mm. girls as well. You know, it's a bit of a male dominated world, so you know, if we can get to talk to these amazing people, and you know, like myself as a new diver, I've had this amazing opportunity to talk to amazing divers and that's probably helped me you know with my sort of early journey so far and it's just mm. yeah sort of just trying to say how you know good it is and how accessible it is as well you know from my side yeah, yeah. it is and i think um if we can play a small part in somebody going i want to go and give that diving a go i think that's job done for us you know uh, mm. i think um if we can do anything to try and motivate people uh, to just go give it a go, uh, even snorkeling, you know, um, it'd be nice to know that we've played a little tiny part. In, um, and I think it's also a little bit weird with, with podcasts and how that is evolving um, because it's quite, I think in the UK, we were quite a bit behind the, U, the US, uh, especially mm -hmm. on numbers. When I was on a previous podcast, um, you know, most of our downloads were in the, uh, US and we had mm. I can think some of our episodes that we put out and we spent hours you know putting putting together 
and you know you'd only get a handful of downloads in the UK. It's like what's going on? But we're getting like hundreds in the US, and we've reached um, seventy plus countries. And you think really? Them? And you know all sorts. And it's amazing. Uh, but now, and I don't know whether it's the COVID thing or because you know at the time we brought this out. You know, it's then started. Um, we're seeing more of a balance where we're getting a lot more downloads in the UK, mm. US, Australia, New Zealand, and Europe, mm. and that is mm. that's really great. Um, it blows me away, to be honest. Every time we get the figures, because I think really, you know, um, you know, I'm just a gardener, really. You know, that's you know, and I enjoy diving, and it always always blows me away that I think you know these people download us to and, and hear about us waffling on about diving talking about it yeah. getting excited but the, mm. the uh learned so much it's been an amazing uh just a few months to be honest well, we've got so much to learn as well so you know mm. we mm. yeah we, we've spoke to some people who've you know who've done some absolute amazing stuff and got amazing stories um you know, and I think, as you've said, you know, it's great to keep pushing forward and learn new things. You've done some great stuff, you know, and you think, wow, I want to learn. I want to learn that next chapter, that next part, that next page. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I compliment you guys. It's a, there's, there's a lot out there now, and I think that's the challenge is how do you stand out in the crowd? And that's, you know, back to the niche thing that, that I chose. Right. That was the strategy. So personality, you know. I think a lot of exactly, exactly. Personality, you know, because Agreed. we can all talk about uh, certain, you know, and also knowing your strengths. Now, I can't talk. Mm. We we can't talk about settings of rebreathers and um, you know what's the best. I, I would. I'm. Pro there's there's always bigger. There's always a bigger fish. You know, mm. there's always going to be divers who've done a lot more diving and done fantastic deep dives and got a lot more experience than what someone like me has. Um, but how we come at it, I think is we, obviously we got Gemma got her story and journey, you know, and I think it's sometimes it's just nice actually getting to know more actually about the diver, mm. you know, mm. because, you know, people like yourself, uh, the Dallas's, John Chatterton's one, they must get asked, the same questions in and out, you know, and mm. uh, and you, it's nice to actually think about maybe for the other person on the other side of the desk, actually make it mm. fun for them. Like, mm. you know, one of the questions that we had for John Chatterton was asking him what music he was listening to in the sub, mm -hmm. you know, and I found that more in, more interesting than actually know yeah. what setting he had on his rebreather. And that's yeah. not taking anything away from him at all, because you know he is a, a column strength in the diving. You know, and mm. he's done everything. And it still amazes me that he was going down these depths, really in the early days of rebreathers. No, and that that was going to break on. Mm. And to me, someone who yeah. does that, it's like whoa. Yeah. He's an immense guy. I, I did my advanced rec course with John in Florida. So, and I chose him specifically because of, you know, his, uh, because of shadow divers in particular, I yeah. didn't actually realize he was, he even taught. So I found his website and went out and had a look at it and said, Oh gee, John teaches courses. What does he teach? Advanced rec. I want to do advanced rec. So I went and trained with him. It was amazing. And he's a very, he's a very, very multifaceted deep guy. You know, he's had a super interesting life and he, has done some amazing things, survived some things that perhaps he shouldn't have, and has achieved some things that, that many can only dream of. And, um, you know, it, he's a, he's a, what the thing I loved about him was, you know, we'd be doing the, the classroom work and he was doing an ice splice for us for a John line. We all had to make, have a John line and he made us one out of size of rope and he was doing an ice splice while he was talking to us, telling us a story of somebody, probably somebody perishing, you know. And yet, yeah. so the, the, the joke in the class was you never wanted to be on one of John's stories because they usually die, you know. So <laughs> it's sad, but at the same time, it's just yeah. what, it, you know, we were just on the edge of our seats for the whole time. And uh, just, you know, as I said, doing this ice splice, which normally you have to pay a bit of attention to, they came out pretty good as well. So yeah, a, amazing experience. Great guy. So it is, yeah, yeah, it was. That was absolute uh, pleasure.
pleasure talking to. The only tip I would, the thing that I've been trying to do is perfect my craft a little bit like diving. So, I, and I've been getting, if I listen back at my early episodes now and compare them to the latest ones, you know, I'm better at speaking, I'm better at asking questions, I'm better at conversing, I'm better at contributing. So all of the things that were a bit of a challenge in the beginning have improved. And, and I think that's the only thing is kind of perfect your craft, have a look around, see what other people are doing, find your own style. And I think you guys have, as you, as you said, Ian, it's personality. And so, you know, between the two of you, um, you have a nice, um, you've got a nice vibe going there and, and there's a good personality thing. And, and I think that's got to be what your podcast is, right? Because because you're in the generic area, there will be other podcasts. Like I don't have any competitors really because no one else is yeah. doing what I what I do. And I and I almost think I would scare them away now from doing it because, you know, you've got to compete with this. It's like, wow, you know, I've been doing it for two years. So, you know, I'm a lot better than before. So I would sort of say, you know, like find what your thing is and you know, and focus on on that and, and amplify that strength. Yeah. And and then just get, get better and better at your craft, you know. It's um the longer you do it, the better you get at asking questions and, and contributing and uh yeah. Thank you very much for all your time. It's been oh you're welcome, you're welcome. It's been yeah, I hope we can catch up in person sometime. Yeah, you too. Yes, you too, yes, absolute yeah. pleasure. Yeah, yeah. Be great. So on those planes again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, take care. Okay. All right, thanks, yeah, Steve. Andrew, take bye. Thank you very bye. much. Okay, bye. Follow. Welcome back, everybody. I uh, hope you enjoyed that. Jen, you enjoy that? Yeah, yeah, no, he's a really good, fun guy, full of variety. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's really good. And I liked hearing his uh, scuba experiences and uh, life as an engineer on the uh, counter. Yeah, and he's got a coffee and ice cream shop as well, and he's been a body combat instructor. So, Did you like my little top tip I gave him, though? About the putting stuff in his shop? Yeah, exactly. He took it on board. <laughs> the invoice will be in the posting. Don't worry about that. Interior designer. <laughs> no, talents I never realised I had. Anyway, let's move on swiftly on that. Um, so, Georgina Miller, you're up next. Yeah. So, Aqua City in Port of Keris, uh, who's a... Um, they're free dives. Yeah, we're bringing it all back to the UK and we're yeah, looking at what dive centres and we've got around our coastline. So Aqua City, yeah, yeah. they specialise in free diving. So uh, we had a really good uh, conversation and chat with Georgina. That was really good. Yeah. And um, just very quickly on the Zoom front, obviously, you know, we all, we use, we use Zoom um, all the time and we're just the same as everybody else. Our quality of recording it is at the hands of the gods of the uh, as much as we pray and give thanks every time to say thank you very much you know sometimes the quality is not as good as what we would hope we ought to just say thank you very much for everybody for sticking with us you know okay but anyway thank you very much for listening it's been a really good episode again um and Gemma thank you very much so Aqua City Georgina Miller talking about free diving and life down there on episode 33 coming up next. Yeah, and how long she can right. hold her breath for. I think it was like seven minutes. Uh, she can hold her breath for like seven minutes or something, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, just face down in the water, not doing anything. Can you imagine doing that? Should we have a go? Are you ready? No. Three, no. two, <laughs> one. <gasps> you know I can't hold my breath for very long. <laughs> I'm rubbish. Well, we've got to try and find your 20 litre um, scuba tank from somewhere, haven't we? <laughs> <laughs> it's about going on the twin sets. I love <laughs> You can't get enough of that air. Oh, gulp, gulp, gulp. <laughs> <That air. laughs> well, we're going to have to try. We're going to try. My name's Gemma and I'm a paddy over water diver. And I love air. <laughs> oh, I love air. Can't get enough of it. <laughs> No, we're going to try a free diving um, course next summer. Well, you have to carry so much lead, isn't it, in the water? <laughs> Just open all this air. Yeah, I'm filling my body with air. Right. Anyway. Okay, thanks. Uh, moving on swiftly again. Uh, right, so everybody, 33 coming up next week. Uh, at the city, look out for them. 
and it will be across all the usual social medias. And if I haven't said it before, I'll say it one more time. If you do get a chance, go on the old Big Scuba podcast YouTube and hit the old subscribe button. Yep, do that. Yeah. There's, there's lots more coming up on YouTube. Yeah, more and more footage. Isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, adding to it all the time. So there's lots of good features coming up. Got them. Uh, rather interesting guests coming up. So um, look there's out. Lots in lots in the pipeline. Yeah, always is, always is. So um, yeah. Brilliant. Okay, well that's it from us. Thank you very much for listening. Oh, very quick last PS. Uh, it's always really great to get your messages. Um, so if you've got any queries, you've got any suggestions for guests, if you've got if you're a band and you've got some music you want us to play, you know we do love playing actual music from bands. Um, but always good to hear from our listeners. Uh, you know, let us know what you're up to got any questions aren't you know, do. great we look forward to hearing from you and we'll be back soon we'll be back see you soon thanks for listening okay bye